It all started with a post-it note. And I looked over and there was a giant box kind of put on a shelf, flat box. That's Jenny Watts. She was a curator at the Huntington Library Museum and Botanical Gardens near Pasadena, California for many years. And a yellow, bright yellow post-it was put on the box and it said, and kind of scrawled in handwriting, do not open. And we just looked at each other and started laughing and we're like, come on, that's like catnip. I mean, of course you're going to open it if it says do not open all over it. And it was a giant vinyl disc, like a record. Um, but it was bigger than any record I'd ever seen. Um, and there was something that made it sound as if it was someone who was giving an eyewitness accounting of President Abraham Lincoln's assassination. I'm Tobiah Black, and this is Artifactual from 1895 Films. I hate saving things. There's nothing I love more than deleting an email or dropping off a box of t-shirts at the Salvation Army or using up the last bit of mustard in the jar. Because saving things creates an obligation. If something is saved, it must be returned to. If you give a mouse a high school yearbook, it'll want a high shelf in a closet to store it on. Given my love of getting rid of things, it's probably strange that I've made my living for the past six years as an archival researcher at a documentary production company. My job is to find things people have saved. And people save some odd things. In the course of our work, my colleagues and I have found a recording of an engineer from the Apollo program discussing dinner plans with his spouse from Mission Control. We found audio notes that a friend of Bill Clinton's made for himself as he drove home from the White House after their first conversation about the Monica Lewinsky scandal. We've even found a recording that a guy made of the sound of a tornado as it tore apart his home. Not all of these make it into our documentaries, But the stories are too good to let them go untold. So we're bringing them to you here in this podcast. And the first story I'm going to tell is the one about that giant shellac record that Jenny Hill found in the vault at the Huntington Library. And it starts with a guy named Stephen Lasker. Stephen's a collector and restorer of old jazz records. I visited him at his home in Venice, California, just a few blocks away from the ocean. We were wearing masks, so Stephen's voice is a little muffled. Okay, if you want to follow me, yeah. go, go around this way. What do we want to get, grab? Okay, well, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll pull up, uh, we'll look in a very rare box. Stephen is in his 60s with a mop of silver hair. He greeted me barefoot. One of the three bedrooms in his house has been entirely converted into a library for his enormous record collection. Floor-to-ceiling wooden shelves stuffed with old records line every wall. But when he says he's going to pull something from a very rare box... It turns out to just be a regular cardboard box on the floor. Fats Waller went to England. That's jazz pioneer Fats Waller. And here he records an alternate take of Ain't Misbehaving. Only copy. Okay, be that way. He's playing the organ. Fats plays either piano or organ, usually piano. In 2003, Stephen had been asked to appraise the records of another collector who had just died. And it was about 100,000 discs, mostly 78s. But I found this disc lying horizontally on top of a bookshelf. And boy, did my eyes do a Tex Avery. Wow, it practically jumped out. Tex Avery was one of the Looney Tunes animators. I had to look that one up. And the record Stephen saw that made his eyes pop out of his head had a red label on it that read... Eyewitness account of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Compliments of Freeman Lang and Transco. Uh, But, you know, it wasn't worth uh, buying 100,000 records to get this one. Go ahead to 2006, and I get this auction list and I'm handing you. And I saw it again. And when it came time to bid, I bid large. I bid more for that record than I have for any other single record. I paid about 4200 But it's the only copy we've ever seen. What was it about it that made it so special, that made it worth that to you? Historical artifact. But until uh, the record arrived, I didn't, I'd never heard it. When the record did arrive, Stephen put it on one of his custom-made turntables and dropped the needle. Joseph H. Hazelton, veteran actor, now in his 80th year, who was program boy at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. when President Lincoln was assassinated, 
and witnessed the actual shooting will give his vivid description of that tragic event. Presenting Joseph H. Hazelton. On the 14th of April, 1865, a little schoolboy, with his books in a strap, thrown carelessly across his shoulder, romped down 10th Street in Washington, D.C. And as he approached Old Ford's Theater, they stood in front a tall, stately man, swarthy of complexion, raven black curly hair, a drooping mustache, and a wondrous kind eye. That man was John Wilkes Booth, who for the act of a madman that night swayed the destiny of our nation. The little schoolboy was myself. When Joseph Hazelton walked into that recording studio in 1933, he was in his late 70s. He'd had a long career as an actor, appearing in almost 60 silent movies. His movies had titles like False Kisses and Love Finds a Way. His last role was in a 1924 film called He Who Gets Slapped. But Hazelton hadn't managed, or hadn't bothered, to make the transition to talkies. In the late 20s and early 30s, he was making his living doing live appearances, telling the story of being at Ford's Theater the night Lincoln was shot. But by 1933, he was sick. He'd been living in Los Angeles, and he'd been hospitalized in Glendale, California earlier that year. So he struck a deal with L.A. radio personality Freeman Lang to record the story and sell the discs to radio stations across the country. This was a new idea at the time. Recorded sound had been around since the late 1870s, but it was all mechanical. They used those big brass horns instead of microphones. And commercial radio had been around since the early 1920s, but almost all of it was live. High-quality electrical recordings didn't become widely available until the late 20s, and even then, playing a recording over the radio was seen as a low-rent substitute for live performance. A lot of the, the more reputable companies, so for example, NBC had a policy that they wouldn't put on any canned music. But Freeman Lang, who owned the recording studio, liked publicity stunts. He had once hired a blimp so that he could float above Los Angeles making announcements about upcoming movie show times. And he was a pioneer of these electrical transcriptions, as they were called then. Recording Joseph Hazelton's story and sending the discs to radio stations all over the country seemed like a natural idea to him. We don't know how many discs were made. In fact, I've found no mention at all of Hazelton's recording in the 80 years between when it was recorded and when it appeared in that auction catalog in the mid-2000s. As far as we know, this is the last copy that survives. And now it was sitting in the hands of Stephen Lasker. And Stephen had to figure out what to do with it. I brought it by my late Aunt Francie, who was my favorite aunt, and I loved her very much. And if you knew my aunt, she's very persuasive, and uh, I, I like to please her. This is the part of the story where I discover that Stephen is kind of a prince of Hollywood. Aunt Francie is Francis Lasker Brody, an art collector, philanthropist, and cultural icon of mid-century L.A. She once commissioned Henri Matisse, one of the most famous artists in the world at the time, to create a mural out of ceramic tiles for her Westwood home, and rejected three of his designs before settling on one she liked. The mural is now at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the home has been occupied by a series of celebrities, including Ellen DeGeneres and Sean Parker of Napster and Facebook fame. So naturally, when Stephen wants to figure out what to do with his historically significant record, he goes to Aunt Francie. She uh, gave a copy to a friend of hers who was the director of research at the Huntington. The Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens is the sprawling former home of Henry E. Huntington and his second wife, Arabella, who also happened to be the widow of Henry's railroad tycoon uncle. The two, mostly guided by Arabella, began collecting 18th century British portraits, rare manuscripts, and roses. Lots of roses. After Henry Huntington died in 1927, their estate became a museum. Just the kind of place Aunt Francie would be connected to. Stephen donated the disc to the Huntington Library in 2008, where it sat in storage for four years until curator Jenny Watts stumbled across it while preparing an exhibition on the Civil War. So we have vast, you know, underground stack storage, compact shelving storage, and then there's a smaller what we call the outer vault, which is where a lot of the rare, important collections are kept. And then there is the inner vault, which is the holy of holies. 
The inner vault is the Huntington's nuclear bomb-proof heart. It's where the most valuable items in the collection are kept. Uh, ben Franklin's autobiography, many drafts of Walden by Thoreau, George Washington's directives to his troops, Shakespeare's first folio. It's, it's like standing in the middle of, you know, the most amazing history of the Western world, um, the Western male white world. And in the inner vault, Jenny found the record. And I was like, oh, come on, like, is this possible? So I ran up to my other colleague who specializes in this field. And I said to her, what, you know, what is that down in the, down in the vault? What, what is that thing? And luckily she didn't say, why did you open it? <laughs> why did you open the box? Which could have, which would have been fair. That colleague was Olga Sapina. G-S-A-P-I-N-A. -A. It's a Russian name, so it's a little weird. Do not open it. it has nothing to do with secrecy. <laughs> it's, it, I know it sounds a little, it kind of, you know, looks a little sinister, but it's mostly because uh, shellac discs from the 1930s are extremely fragile, that there are so few of them. <laughs> shellac records are very different from the vinyl records we think of today, as Stephen explained to me. Yeah, you know, what it's, shellac is made of is, is uh, Balakba, and they live in Burma and, and uh, India. And uh, they, they lie the, the, the jungle floors. Yeah. And they get scooped up and crushed and powdered and then heated into shellac that can be pressed. It's very breakable. In case you missed it, Stephen just said that old records like this one used to be made from crushed up bugs. And I said, is that really a recording of someone who witnessed Abraham Lincoln's assassination, she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's just, it's filled with errors and it's kind of hokey. When you listen to it, his voice is very old timey, old school professional actor's voice. I was like, yeah, but I mean, he was there, right? He was actually there at the assassination. So I said, well, is there any way I can listen to it? The house was packed from pit to dawn. The president's party came late. Second act was on. In the party was Mr. Lincoln, Mrs. Lincoln, Surgeon General Barnes, and Miss Harris, daughter of Senator Harris. And as the party entered the theater, the orchestra played Hail to the Chief. The audience rose in mass and cheered. President Lincoln came down to the edge of the box, and with that sad, sweet smile, that he was wont to wear on such occasions, bowed his acknowledgments, and the play went on. I was standing looking directly up at the president's box, smiling when he smiled, all enraptured with that wonderful face. He was an idol to me. I listened to it, and I just, I was completely blown away. It's all the things she said. It's a little hokey. It's uh, full of errors and... Um, it is also incredibly profound. Lincoln didn't want to go to the theater on April 14th, 1865. He was tired, worn down. His wife, Mary, had a headache. Confederate General Robert E. Lee had only surrendered at Appomattox five days earlier, on April 9th. Before leaving for the theater, Lincoln is reported to have said, I suppose it's time to go, although I would rather stay. A, a few days before he goes, he gives his primary bodyguard um, a leave of absence. And we actually at the Huntington have the pass that he wrote, scrawled on kind of a little note card to his bodyguard, um, giving him several days leave. So his primary bodyguard was not with him that night. Here's Hazelton again. I was standing looking directly up at the president's box, smiling when he smiled, all enraptured with that wonderful face. He was an idol to me. I happened to turn my eyes to the right, to the main entrance. I saw Wilkes Booth enter. Now he had on heavy cavalry boots, spurs, blue army shirt and a slouched army hat. As he went up the steps to the right, towards the president's box, I wondered in my childish way 
what he could be doing there in such a garb on such an auspicious occasion. I didn't have long to wait. It was a flash and a report. President Lincoln had been assassinated. John Wilkes Booth bursts into Abraham Lincoln's box and shoots him point blank in the back of the head. When Booth fired the shot, he dropped the weapon and drew a knife. Surgeon General Barnes attempted to stop him and received an ugly gash in the arm. Booth got to the edge of the box, leaped over. As he did so, his spur caught in the flag that draped the box. He tripped and fell to the stage. I shall never forget to my dying day the look of anguish and despair on that man's face as he half dragged and half limped to the center of the stage with a wild maniacal stare brandished the knife above his head and cried out, Six Amper Tyrannus! There are not words enough in the vocabulary of the English language to describe the awful hush fell over that house when the shot was fired. Everyone seemed to realize that something terrible had happened, but no one seemed to take the initiative. Till Laura Keene, coming from her dressing room, ran down to the edge of the stage and cried out, Ladies and gentlemen, the president's been shot. Then all was pandemonium. The, there was only really one moment that struck me, and it was where he just said that it was silent, and then all was pandemonium. And for me, something clicked. I just thought, yes, I can, it put me there. But remember those historical inaccuracies that Jenny and Olga said Hazleton's account is riddled with? They're actually more than inaccuracies. Some of the things are smaller, like getting the time that Lincoln arrived wrong or misidentifying his guests in the presidential box. But some are outright conspiracy theories. Like the story Hazleton tells about what happened to Booth after he shot Lincoln. Now history says he broke his leg. Such is not the case. Had Booth have broken his leg, he never in the world could have gotten across that 60 foot of stage. He managed to get out to the stage entrance, mounted his horse, and drove away. At Eastern Branch, he was joined by young Harold, the youngest of the conspirators. Booth said to young Harold, I'm going to escape, make a trip to South America if I can get a ship, which he did. 1903, a man by the name of St. Heaven committed suicide by taking 16 grains of arsenic. And on his deathbed, he confessed that he was Booth. It plays into this whole conspiracy theory that John Wilkes Booth never really died at the hands of the federal officials that he lived and and was on the land. So what do we do with Hazleton's version of the Lincoln assassination? Do we write it off because of the inaccuracies and the conspiracy mongering? When Jenny Watts was putting together her exhibition on the Civil War, she told me she was plagued with doubt. Then a colleague gave her a piece of advice, which I think can help us answer this question. I'll never forget, I met with her over coffee and I was telling her, I said, I'm just terrified of doing this exhibition. And she looked at me and she said, you know, it's not their civil war. You get to make it your civil war. <laughs> and that freed me up to do um, what I did. So maybe we can just accept that this is Hazleton's Lincoln assassination. Bombastic, over-rehearsed, and sometimes just plain wrong. But it's Hazleton who comes to life in this recording more than Lincoln or Booth. It's Hazleton's starstruck impressions of both Booth and Lincoln that we get. And it's Hazleton's garbled understanding of the aftermath of the assassination that we get to. Maybe it's exactly that garbled understanding, with its human mistakes, that makes this version of the story feel present to us. Here's Olga Sapina again. The whole story comes uh, comes alive in, in this disc, not only of, of Booth and Lincoln, but also a young boy named Joe Hazleton. And it really is quite important to resurrect these people just because they're dead. <laughs> Uh, doesn't make them any less human. Hazleton died in 1936, just three years after he made his recording. And the story might have ended there if not for people like Stephen and Jenny and Aunt Francie, who noticed this strange-looking disc with its intriguing red label 
and managed to pass it from collector to collector without ever tripping and dropping it and shattering the delicate shellac, which, don't forget, is made from bugs, before we got a chance to hear it. Thanks for listening. Artifactual is written and produced by me, Tobiah Black. Our executive producers are Tom Jennings and Ellen Farmer at 1895 Films. Fran from 17th Street Audio did the sound design and mixing for this episode. If you want to learn more about our documentaries, you can find us on Twitter at 1895films or at 1895films.com. <laughs>